Hello and welcome, David Gibson. Hi, David. Nice to be with you today. Nice to be with you, David. Thank you for taking the time. David, tell us everything we need to know about you in 60 seconds. 60 seconds. Well, I'm married to Angela. and uh, We live in Aberdeen in the northeast of Scotland. We have four children and I'm from Belfast originally, Northern Ireland. Uh, Angela is from London and somehow we ended up at the opposite end of the country from her family right up in the northeast of Scotland. Four children born here. When we sat down last Saturday night to watch Ireland absolutely hammer Scotland in the Rugby World Cup, my two sons are supporting Scotland. And it's a terrible moment, you know. Um, <laughs> so that's what you need to I've got, um, I, I'm Irish, Angela's English. We've got Scottish children. I'm the pastor of Trinity Church in Aberdeen. I've been with this group of people about 20 years altogether um, since we moved here. And yeah, that's that's who I am. That's what I do. Very good. You might have to actually explain what rugby is for the, the American <laughs> listeners. It's basically a better version of American football, right? That's right. It's American football played by harder men. They just don't wear the pads. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Very good. David, how and when did you become a Christian? So I was really privileged and, and I, I feel this more and more the older I get with my own children. <clears throat> really privileged to grow up in a Christian home with parents who who know and love the Lord. And they were missionaries in Tanzania and East Africa. So um, after I was born, we moved out there. And the first eight years of my life were with, with my parents working with Math Mission Aviation Fellowship. So I don't really ever remember a time. I don't remember a time of not being exposed to Christian things. My own theology of conversion has changed a little bit since since I was converted in that the tradition I grew up in, mum and dad were very much hoping for each of their children to pray the sinner's prayer and ask Jesus into our hearts, which I think I probably did 15 or 20 times. I don't know. I don't know which one of them it was or if it was even any one of them. Um, I, I I don't know. I don't know when exactly. I think there's a couple of moments when I think maybe I could I think yeah, something was different from that point onwards. But um, I'm not reformed presbyterian pastor it's not how we're bringing up our own children i don't i i hope they don't ever remember a distinctive conversion moment yeah. if you know what i mean um yeah. so i would say i had the privileges of being a covenant child brought up in a covenant environment without ever using that language yeah and when did you feel called to pastoral ministry um i, I that, that, that's a good question because i think i I'm in pastoral ministry because I kept saying uh, I'm going to do a bit, little bit more Christian ministry, a little bit more training, a little bit more studying, and and once I've done that, then I'll go and become a, a school teacher. I always wanted to be a, a a a school teacher, and it just never happened. I just kept putting it off by doing a bit more ministry and a bit more of this. And eventually, a really good friend in a church we were in here in in Scotland said, "Look, just." forget that other stuff you need to give yourself to this instead so it was it, it was really the calling of a local church that said we want you to do this we think you're we, we want to set you aside for it we think God is setting you aside for it it's not like I had a 20-year burning desire that I'm going to be a pastor it was a sort of slow realization of yeah this is what I think I should do other people are telling me sort of things you and this is what I now want to do so it it, it, it took a while but but from the moment, I was about to say I've never looked back. I've never looked back in the sense that every minister I know on Sunday night wants to get another job, and I still <laughs> I still have that every week. But not not in the deep sense of uh, it, it's it's a calling and a vocation that is why I'm still here. Yeah, yeah, I understand that Sinclair Ferguson is a member of the church where you pastor. Of course, Sinclair is an excellent preacher himself as well as a gifted writer. David, how much extra pressure does it put on you having Sinclair sitting there staring back at you as you preach? Yeah, that, that, a lot of a lot of people have asked me that. Um, so I, it, it's true, David, isn't it that there's some the cert, you know, the Christian circles that we're in, where people write books and speak at conferences and so on. That there are we, we tend to make certain people a big deal, or we think certain people are a big deal because of their well-known ministry. That's one thing. But it's true as well, isn't it, that 
there are people like that who we make a big deal, who they then themselves, they think they're a big deal. And all I can say about Sinclair is that he's the exact opposite. That if, if anyone else thinks he's a big deal, he would say, well, that's your problem. I'm Sinclair. I'm an ordinary believer, the same as you. And it's probably one of the most defining things about him, I think, that he does he does not think he's a big deal. And having having him as part of the Trinity family, that's what he communicates, that he's a church member, the same as anyone else. Um I I I you know, he 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 in his commentary in Ephesians, he tells the story of Augustine's conversion, where Augustine said to Ambrose, the Bishop of Milan, it wasn't your rhetoric it wasn't your sermons that led me to christ it was your kindness and i think that's the main thing i would say about sinclair that he he's just a he's a because he he doesn't think he's a big deal because he thinks he's a christian first and foremost and it, it's made him a profoundly kind man so yeah. um I, it might sound strange but i don't i don't i to me, I know I'm preaching to a giant, but I don't also as well in the way I just think he's part of our church family. And I I, I know how he's hearing this. So, yeah. yeah. Does that make sense? It does. Yeah. Yes. That's very good. David, we're here to talk about an exciting new book that you have published with Crossway, The Lord of Psalm 23. Just introduce a book to us, David, and tell us why you wanted to write it. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's just come out. Uh, no, I'm not sure if it's actually out in the UK yet. Um, it's out, available in the States. It'll be out in the UK at the end of October. Um, l- like like just about anything I've written, it's because of preaching, first and foremost. So I preached three sermons on Psalm 23, uh, j- January, one January a few years ago. And it's kind of the effect of that on me. There are some things when I preach, I think, oh, this this is really hitting home very deeply. And um, I want to write it up in some way. One of my good friends, you know, was laughing at me for writing a book in Psalm 23. He said that, yeah, we really need more books on Psalm 23, that oft neglected part of scripture. <laughs> um, so, yeah, whether it's needed or not, I don't know. Other people have to be the judge of that. But the, it, 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 there is a reason why that Psalm has meant so much to us, isn't there? And a chance to study it and preach on it. I just wanted to live in it a little bit longer. So in a way, writing a book and it was a chance to go even deeper than the sermons and just get to treasure this most beautiful part of scripture for a little bit longer. So it did me good, whether it, what it'll do for other people, I don't know. Well, I've heard, I've heard a lot of the um, endorsements for it and it certainly uh, seems to have got off to a good start. Why is it so important to not skip past the significance of the shepherd's name in verse one, that he is the Lord? Yeah, I, I that's something that I think I've hit on a little bit, that it, there's only a few people that I've noted, I read that that focus on this. We all We all know the opening words, the Lord is my shepherd. And what I what I argue in the opening chapter is that we we've we all focus on shepherd and the shepherd imagery dominates the psalm. But the astonishing thing is that David says, my shepherd is the Lord. And that name, the Lord, capital letters, God's personal name revealed to Moses, Yahweh, I, I am, I am that I am. I argue in the book that that the fact that that one is my shepherd is David shepherd my shepherd your shepherd that that should just make us we shouldn't get any further than those first four words and think hang on hang on you you mean that one that that God is my shepherd the God of the burning bush is my is mine he's going to care for me and look after me and th- that self-revelation of God, that designation of the shepherd being the Lord, means that everything that is true about the self-existent, eternally self-sufficient, divine being who n- needs no one and whose own life is caused by no one, imagine having a shepherd like that. Um, that That's what I try and linger on a little bit. And I... And, there's, there's actually a lot of shepherding connections to the revelation of the divine name in Exodus. Uh, the, 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 there are parts of the rest of the Old Testament where 
the, the, the way I would put it is that if you were to if you were to paint a picture of the Exodus, the way that the Bible paints the picture, the way the Bible puts the Exodus on Instagram is by describing God as a shepherd leading his people through the wilderness. And Moses and Aaron are the under shepherds. That's literally what the Psalms say, that he led his people through the wilderness like a flock. By the hand of yeah. Moses and Aaron, he guided them. Um, so there's a lot more going on in Psalm 23, I think, with the shepherding imagery than we often think there is. Yeah, yeah, really good. And sometimes by it being so familiar can actually not be very helpful, right? Day because we can actually right. read past these things far too quickly not to, to actually marinate in these truths right yeah yeah exactly exactly yeah so just how important is the shepherding imagery that we're given in psalm 23 yeah so that's the other bit of it although i think we need to pause at the first two words the lord yes. so obviously the psalm then does go on to say the lord is my shepherd and of course the psalm is couched the psalm then is painted in shepherd images the, the pastures, the water, the feeding, the resting, the leading, the rod, the staff. Um, so in a way, you can't really obviously get, you know, if you if you preach a doctrinal sermon series on Psalm 23, on, let's say, union with Christ or on the divine name, which you could do, but you don't you don't stop to feel the beauty of everything that a shepherd does for a sheep um so the the that then you've missed the point of psalm 23 that it's the beauty of the divine name and who god is but not in abstract dusty systematic theology which is where we often think all the stuff about divine simplicity and divine self existence belongs psalm 23 takes all of that and says no Imagine that being the description of the person who's by your side every day of your life, who speaks to you every day, who feeds you, cares for you. Um, and what I think Psalm 23 does is it blends shepherding imagery with hosting imagery and really beautifully. So in the in the in the ancient Near East, shepherds and hosts were both meant to be entirely responsible for your care. If you were a shepherd, you took care of everything for your sheep. If you were a host, when the guest comes to your house, you took care of everything. And Psalm 23 says, let's put those both together and say that the Lord is both of those amazing pictures. Yeah. Um, so it's a really beautiful, it's a really beautiful text, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Really, really good stuff. In your book, you make the point that everyone has shepherds. Tell us about that, David. Yeah, this is a this is a point I got just from um, a Bible teacher in England called Mike Cain, who's based in, in Bristol somewhere, I think, in Bristol in England. He has a lovely little book called Real Life Jesus. That is his series of evangelistic talks on John's gospel. And when he gets to John 10, talking about Jesus, the good shepherd, he, he just I, I, got, I got all this from him. He just makes the point that it's it's very easy to think that shepherding is an ancient biblical picture you know there's yes there are shepherds today but we don't do it like them and shepherding is remote from us but mike came makes point no it's not at all that the the all of life is all about following somebody we are always following someone and today the dominant shepherds are called youtube and they're called instagram and they're called tiktok um that's who is shepherding our children. We, we might think we're shepherding, but actually they're following, you know, and, and think of the language in social media is how many followers do you have? Yeah. Somebody, somebody's leading. Um, we, we're always being influenced, shaped. Our lives are not, we're not the independent captains of our soul that we think we are. We're, we're sheep. We're following the people with the power, the money, the influence. Um and the, the the whole Bible and Psalm twenty three says, right, let's let's put all those other influencers off to the side and think about the best possible influencer that you could have. Yeah, yeah, good, really good. David, what do you mean when you say Psalm twenty three has become a funeral psalm, but in fact it is really a psalm about life? Yeah, so in the book, in the book, I rely on a couple of other scholars who point out that. Um, a, a man called William Holiday, who sh who's shown that really 
Psalm 23 wasn't much used in funerals before the American Civil War. And it's only after that time and after the, um, the arrival of the Enlightenment and the growth of sentimentality in religious language that didn't used to exist, that Psalm 23 has begun to be used at funerals because, in his words, it's really non-threatening. It doesn't talk about sin, doesn't talk about um, confrontation. God, you know, secular people like this psalm, Jews as well as Christians identify with it. So it, Psalm 23 has this kind of, you know, you can imagine it, it belongs on Hallmark cards and soft focus photos and um there's all this world of comfort in it that we give to people at death because it talks about the valley of the shadow of death. But actually, that's the only verse that mentions death, isn't it? Verse four. Mm -hmm. Apart from that, you have the shepherd making me lie down, feeding me, guiding me. Um, and then verse five, preparing a table for me, oil, my cup overflows. He's leading me to his house. Th th this is a psalm about not just about what you need as you come to die but it's a psalm about what you most need as you come to live as you walk this wilderness life between now and heaven what is it that you most need for daily life and for living and that the psalm is all about that it has everything in it yeah yeah really good stuff what's the most accurate way to understand the word want in verse one uh, yes, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Um, so if you don't mind me just referring to what I wrote, wrote, my wrote what I wrote on it. Yeah, the, the, so we say the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And if we're honest, we think, but hang on, I want, you know, I'm about to go on holiday. I can't wait to get, I want a holiday. I want food. I want relationship. We want things all the time. So what does it what does it mean to say I don't want? The best way to understand it is that actually the word want has come down to us from the King James version of the Bible, where in the in the Elizabethan age, the word want meant not so much to desire something as to lack something. So it, it's more like the phrase, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be found wanting. Uh, in other words, I shall lack for nothing. And one Jewish rabbi's translation is that it means God will provide me with everything I need. Or as a colleague of mine beautifully rendered it, the Lord is my shepherd. What more do I need? Um, whether I want certain things is almost beside the point. You might want them, but with the Lord as your shepherd, you do not need them. And with the yeah. Lord as your shepherd, you you have everything. It's, it's the Apostle Paul in the New Testament, isn't it, saying that he's learned in all circumstances, whether in much or plenty, to be content. He, he, he has Christ, and he might have nothing, yeah. but he has everything. Yeah, it's very good. Very good. How does the psalm help us understand how every part of life is in God's wise and good hands? So one of the surprises, I think, in the psalm is, and and, and we, we, might, we can talk about this a little bit, I think, that it the, the valley of the, this is what, again, what I think I saw more clearly than I'd ever seen before. The valley of the shadow of death it is one of the paths of righteousness in verse three. So every, it's not that you have God leading me now beside the still waters and everything's rosy and he's cared for all my needs. But of course, there are these really awful things that happen over here that yeah. the poor shepherd has no control over and you've got to do it alone like don't worry once you get there he'll look after you and be there but it's not that's somehow separate from his care but the psalm doesn't let us say that he leads me in paths of righteousness next verse even though i walk through the valley of the shadow of death i will fear no evil for you are with me so the sh the, sh the shepherd doesn't leave the paths of righteousness when he takes us into the valley of the shadow of death so that, I think that's what I mean by every single part, the highs, the lows, the mountaintops, the valleys, the feeding, the hungering, the living, the dying. It's all in God's hands. Yeah. Yeah. So, David, how does the psalm address the vast longing of a human heart for true rest? So I, I think this is where this is why. 
that this is why the psalm is, has been has become so universally popular. It's such a good question, David. You're asking because there is just something about Psalm 23 that does do that. It does address the human the longing for true rest, mm-hmm. and it's almost it's such a the psalm does it so beautifully that it's actually quite hard to explain why it's doing that and why we're drawn to it so much. What I what I try and argue in the in the book. Um, which is a, a quote from a Jewish a Jewish scholar who says this. He says, God's world, and I think this is the opening language of the, the, the verses of the psalm, verses one to three. God's world, decorated in blues and greens, calms us, gently bathing our eyes with quiet, low-intensity colors. We spend so much of our lives in a man-made environment with artificial lighting and artificial cooling and heating, We're surrounded by bright neon signs, color television programs, that when we get a day off, we instinctively feel the need to find our way to God's world with its more restful palette. So why do people go to lakes and beaches and mountains and for for holidays? He's arguing it's because there's something, God has built the world in such a way that there's something restful about nature that our soul understands. But what Psalm 23 does is it says, yes, so that lovely holiday feeling that you have on a holiday or you want to be in the world, out in God's world. It's just a pale reflection of the longing that you have to be at perfect rest with God. There's a reason why when God made the world, it was a garden before it ever was meant to become a city. There's a reason why at the end of the book of the Bible in Revelation, city and garden are all melded together into one perfect cosmic reality the dwelling of god will come down from heaven and everything that eden was meant to be will now be even better and perfectly realized and in that end time picture there are gardens again trees rivers psalm 23 somehow just taps into all that and says this is where we're heading this is the way the world was meant to be the reason you find it restful is because you would have found it restful if Adam and Eve hadn't fallen and they'd made the the world the garden that it was always meant to be that the psalm manages to tap into this yeah deep sense that a world of fracture and brokenness is is not you know no one chooses a holiday in a war no one's choosing to go to Gaza and Palestine Israel right now are they it's the opposite of what the human heart wants yeah. And the psalm manages to capture that and to say, this is what 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 God gives us. Yeah, that's just magnificent, isn't it? So, so good. So helpful. Thank you. What does it mean that everything Jesus does for his sheep, he does for his namesake? Yeah, it's a little phrase that's easy to lose, isn't it? You've got all the lovely imagery of what the, who the shepherd is, what the shepherd does. And right at the end of verse 3, he leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. I, I I think it's just a really important thing to reflect on that the the point of the shepherding is not for the sheep, but the point of the shepherding is for the shepherd's glory and the shepherd's fame. That everything about my life, all this amazing care, the Lord is my shepherd, the Lord is my host. Ah, I must be really, I must be really something, you know. Um, is the difference, you know, cat, cat, cats and dogs, you know, the difference between cats and dogs that you do everything for, you do everything for the dog and the dog, you feed it, care for it, walk and the dog says, oh, that's amazing. You, you must be God. You do all the same things for the cat and the cat says, oh, that's amazing. I must be God. Um, right. and hu- human beings, I think we are innately cat-like that we think, we think we're something, we think we deserve things, we think, look what God is doing for me. And yet, if if as you see what the, the Lord, the shepherd does, you elevate yourself beyond being a, a creature, when you realize that what the Lord does for us is also sometimes to take us lower than we ever thought we could go, yeah. that the same Lord could ever lead us into the valley of the shadow of death where all i can see is darkness and i cannot see any way out of it 
unless unless we believe that the ultimate purpose of everything is for his name's sake not my name's sake you might know, how, how can this life and what i experience often be for my name's sake there's nothing about it that is helping my name and actually you learn from the psalm that the, the mountain tops of the valleys every single bit in, in john's john piper's language every single bit of it is for his fame not yeah. my fame yeah. and it's yeah. a profoundly helpful profoundly helpful thing that god has stapled the honor of his name to his people so closely that what happens to them will ultimately be for his glory not not our own glory and that's such an important message for us to receive, David, isn't it? I mean, you know, the, the volume of, of so-called Christianity in the Western world is man-centered. It's a prosperity gospel. It's all about us flourishing. It's all about man. Yeah. But that can be so dangerous, can't it? Yeah, absolutely. A hundred percent. Yeah. We've taken our eyes. I was doing some teaching on this the other day and was saying to students, you know, if, we, if you advertise, let's say a Saturday night one-off talk or a series or something for your church people and you said we're going to study the doctrine of god on saturday nights for six weeks or one off or whatever or we're going to do six weeks on how to have a happy marriage which one would be most signed up for now it's not wrong to do the happy marriage bit that's just as much a part of the bible as anything else but our our appetite for god is weak and our appetite for what works and what makes my life better is strong isn't it yeah, so true. David, is there any significance of the psalmist's choice to use the word walk in verse four as opposed to run or to hurry, for example? So this is a this is something that I got from Charles Spurgeon that he he says uh, Spurgeon's Treasury of David is really worth lingering over for anybody working their way through the Psalms as a whole, but Psalm 23. Um in particular he just says it's in verse four you need to linger over every single word and he's brilliant at this you know he he, he even lingers on the even um and one of the words that he lingers on is the walk and in in spurgeon's kind of phrasing it's this isn't exactly what he says but it's effectively what he says is what what kind of person in their right mind walks through the valley of the shadow of death that that's the bit we 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 get being you know he leads me beside still waters well that's not there's no rush there is there that's calm and gentle and we all take our time by the peaceful lake but when you go through the valley of the shadow of death you speed up you're looking over your shoulder you're checking your watch you're looking ahead how you know counting down the time on the clock but Spurgeon says now here's a sheep walking walking through the valley of the shadow of death what kind of person does that and he he says the person that does it is the person who really knows and believes that the, the Lord is with him so that the child will run through the dark corridor to get to the but if if mum or dad are with them they walk the the child sleeps in the house at night time because mum or dad are there and yeah. that's what the sense is in verse four that you know we're so used to the language the valley of the shadow of death but to walk through it, and I and I say this in the book that my job is in being in pastoral ministry, there 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 is no greater privilege than visiting someone who is dying, who knows where they're going, who knows the shepherd, and because of all of those things, is ready to die. I think it's I think those are the sacred moments in pastoral ministry, being in the presence of somebody. Andrew Peterson has a song about the Queen of Iowa that she, this woman that he knew was dying of cancer, but he says she was more alive than anybody else in the room. Yeah. And it's that kind of meeting sheep ready to meet their, n n not just accepting the end, but walking with the shepherd into the darkness is a, yeah. there are no words really to describe it. It's a profoundly beautiful yeah. thing. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. David, what does it mean that the Lord prepares a table for us in the presence of our enemies? Well, one of the things I argue in the book is it's quite helpful for us that that is open-ended, that we don't actually know, and people, this is what commentators do, even on 
6 verses 73, a huge amount of ink on what David must have been referring to here. Um, and from academic commentators through to pub popular, there's, you know, the there's just a massive spectrum. And the short answer is, I think we don't actually know exactly what he was referring to. I, I personally think it's from 2 Samuel when he's on the run from Absalom and soldiers soldiers come and feed him in the wilderness just before battle. Um, I think that's most likely. But the fact that he doesn't say that help, helps us. Like Paul saying in 2 Corinthians that he has a thorn in his flesh. Again, if if he'd said definitively this is his eyesight or this was something else, um, we today would we would be able, we wouldn't be as helped by the thorn in the flesh idea, because unless you had exactly what Paul had, uh, this isn't, you can't, you can't claim the same help. But the fact that we don't know is a really beautiful thing. It just means there are some things that can nearly break you. And yet in that moment, God's grace is sufficient for you. Yeah. And I think it's the same here that whatever it was that David was facing the, the meaning is that even at the moments of greatest human vulnerability and weakness and threat and danger, and whatever that might be, this is what it was for David, but whatever it might be for me and for you, in that very moment, the Lord does not abandon his people. And whether it is the world, the flesh, the devil against you, what, God, the, the shepherd is with you even right there. And, and I argue in the book that we see the best examples of that in the ministry of the Lord Jesus, that there is a huge amount of tables being prepared in the presence of his enemies. He, he, the, the more he eats with the wrong kind of people, the more the cross looms closer and yeah. right through to the Passover meal. I mean, what an amazing table spread in the presence of his enemies, a friend who he, who, a friend who turns out to be a betrayer. And Judas goes out into the night with clean feet and a full belly, a murderous enemy, and the Lord has spread a table before him. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, incredible. Really helpful. Thank you. I know you've mentioned um, at the beginning of our interview that you've taken the time to preach through Psalm 23. David, I, I just wondered, how important is it that the preacher makes a distinction between those listening that believe and those that do not? I, I think it's really important. And because you see this, it's, it's an awful thing. At, and I, I take, I've had to take several funerals of unbelieving folks where they want Psalm 23 read. And because the words are so known, they, they're they're giving some kind of comfort to people, the comfort of nostalgia, the comfort of church memories, the comfort of something, but they do not know the shepherd. Yeah. They, 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 they're not able to say the Lord is my shepherd. And again, I say this in the book that, you know, I, the job of the pastor, I think, in different forms, in different ways and in preaching is to say to people often what, is he your shepherd and where where are you with this shepherd um psalm 23 is not as comforting as people think it is it, it, when you of course it is but it also has the challenge of well if you want this one as your shepherd are you happy to say that he leads you into valleys as much as yeah this funeral that we're at today do we really believe this is the lord's doing the Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Oh, it's it's only believers that get that. It's only believers that that realize the funeral of the loved one is a time for reverent, mute awe that the Lord the Lord did this. And yeah. Psalm twenty three says that to us, help and helps us with that. Uh, David, thank you so much for your time. I really enjoyed speaking to you. Really enjoyed reading your book as well. We're going to make sure that there's a link um, to that in the description. But I was going to ask you, actually, the sermons that you did on Psalm 23, are they on your church website? They're on our church website. And there's two forms of them. You can go to our Trinity YouTube channel. That's where you'll see them. And you'll 
see three sermons there on Psalm 23 that were the original sermons that led to the book. And then last summer, our denomination that I'm in, the International Presbyterian Church, we have a summer conference every year called Catalyst in Ealing in West London. And I gave three talks, three expositions there on Psalm 23, which are more of a blend of the original sermons and the book. And they're also on the YouTube channel. So you can get the same sermons in two different forms. Excellent. Well, I'm going to find the links for those and I'll make sure they're in the description wherever you're listening or watching this interview as well. David, before we let you go, please take a moment to let us know your closing thoughts and also let people know how they can follow you on social media. Well, thank you. It's been a real privilege. They've loved being able to talk to you. I'm really grateful for your interest in the book. Um, I, I, in terms of closing thoughts, all I'd want to do is commend Sam 23 to people. If you find my book helpful, wonderful, but like I joked at the start, there are so many things out there. So find something good on Sam 23 and m- marinate in it. Let it, let it do its work in you and your heart and mind. And you, you will come to know and love Christ better and more through it. Um, what did, social media? I, yeah, I'm I'm on Twitter, David N Gibbo. Uh, I'm on Instagram. Find me, say hello. Yeah, yeah, and I'll find the links to those, and they'll be in the description below as well, as well as the link to this book. So make sure you check that out. David, thanks again. Enjoy your holiday tomorrow. Thank, Thank you very you. much for your time. Enjoyed thanks being so with much you. Thanks for having me.